My name is Robin Cogart, and welcome to the first show of Bark. Now, this is going to be a TV show that I'm hoping will educate dog owners about training and health. And we're even going to have a breed spotlight, so you learn something new every week about dog breeds. Um, this is Minnie. She's my dog. She's a uh, five-pound, three-year-old Chihuahua Papillon mix. She's a rescue from Tennessee, and uh, she just has so much to say, and she loves to do tricks. So what I'm hoping is that I'll be able to show you a little segment called A Minute with Minnie, uh, and that's a little bit later. But for now, what I wanted to uh, go over with you is introduce you to a new and unique dog breed called Norwich Terriers. And I sit down with my friend Tracy at her beautiful farm. And uh, we talk about the Norwich Terriers that she has. And then later in the show, we're going to do training with Danielle. And uh, Danielle is a very experienced dog trainer who uh, was kind enough to take the time to show us some dog training and some tricks for my neighbor's dog patients. Let's take a look. And welcome to Breed Spotlight on Bark. And today I'm out at my friend Tracy's home to talk about Norwich Terriers. Hi Tracy. Hi Robin. Thank you so much for having me over. It's my pleasure. My favorite topic. <laughs> I, I wonder why. <laughs> um, I understand that you have three beautiful Norwich Terriers and we can't see them too well right now so I'll show you a little bit close up of them later. And I wanted to uh, ask you about this unique breed. Right. Yeah, you don't see them very much uh, oh. out and about, and um, that's because I think they, well, they're very hard to whelp, uh, but they also, the breeders of them, keep them pretty close to close hand on them. Um, the breed is from England. Um, around the mid 19th century, uh -huh. uh, they were bred as sort of rat dogs, vermin dogs, uh, in the area of Cambridge. And, uh, <laughs> and they... <laughs> Wait, we have another dog joining us. We have another dog. Aww. I have another dog. I uh, had sworn off of big dogs, but this one came into our lives uh, yeah. as a rescue. So we can talk about her another time. <laughs> okay. But um, back to the Norwich Terriers. Um, they were bred in England and uh, sold to students at Cambridge. I'm not quite sure why, maybe as uh, little hunting dogs or to keep their rats and vermin out of their dorms, I'm not quite sure. But um, they're known as the smallest of the working terriers, which means uh -huh. that they're the smallest of the, the breed that is actually bred for work. Um, doing things like vermin hunting and, and keeping uh, the vermin population down. They also use them for uh, fox hunting. When the fox would go to ground, um, someone who was riding along with the hunt would uh -huh. keep the dog in a pouch and they would put the dog uh. in the burrow and it would get the fox to bolt out and they would continue on with the fox hunt. So they're very, as despite the fact that they're super cute, um, they're tough little dogs and they can uh, do a lot of things and we do a lot of things with them. We live on a farm as you can see and I have horses and um, part of why I sort of fell in love with them is because they're just game for anything. That's Whether great. you're sitting on the couch and watching TV uh -huh. or going cross country skiing, they're wow. happy to come along for hours. So they're pretty hardy, they they're do well in the cold? They're very hardy, do well in the cold. Uh, these guys are getting a little on in years, but um, they've always wanted to come with us. I just this morning took a nice long walk and a couple of them came along. And, um, and that's what I really like about them is that they're just very, you know, hardy. 
How did you come about deciding to get a Norwich Terrier and where did you get them yeah, from? It's a, it's a funny story because I, um, I boarded my horse at a barn for the winter uh -huh. and they had three Norwich Terriers at nice. that barn. And I'd always been a big dog person. I've had Alaskan Malamutes, Labrador Retrievers. And um, so when I went in with my things and these little dogs came uh -huh. you know, sort of around my feet, I was like, sort of, I didn't exactly kick them, but yeah, <laughs> so I them, them away. out of the way with my foot. Uh -huh. But as uh, over the course of that winter that I was there, I just fell in love with how uh, game they were to do anything, how uh -huh. friendly they are. At one point I had thought I'd wanted a Jack Russell uh -huh. and I did some re research on them. And uh, it's funny, the book started out, Jack Russells rarely die of old age because they're always into something that's going to get them into trouble. And it also said, if you have cats, don't even think about getting a Jack Russell. Because to them, because it's... Because they just are yeah. so driven yeah. that they will go to, wow. I mean, through anything. These guys are a lot more laid back than that. Uh -huh. you know, they're fun, uh -huh. but they're not so you know, driven to uh, excel at killing things. Um, if they chase a squirrel or something away from the bird feeder, they'll chase it for a few, you know, <laughs> feed, and then they go, oh, okay, that's enough of that, and they come back. <laughs> um, so they're, they're, they're not obsessive about no, it. No, they're yeah. not at all obsessive. They're just a really good, um, great personality. Yeah. Get along with everyone really get along well with children you know a that's lot of important. little dogs are not known for so loving children. do you think they'd be a good family dog absolutely good. They really do. um they're hard to find as i said though and the way i so once i decided i wanted one um i tried finding breeders uh, uh -huh. there is one breeder in the state of new hampshire for norwich terriers one wow. and um she had a very long list waiting list of uh, people who wanted them and um, tried calling around or you know finding other people yeah. and the only people I could find either wouldn't answer the phone or didn't you know return calls it was really sort of discouraging at first so I told my husband I said we have to go to the dog show you know the dog show. <laughs> Are you talking uh, about in New York? Westminster. Wow. And uh, he said, why? I said, because I have to meet some people. Yeah, you just can't breed them. call yeah. them up. They because will before they have the all breeds, they do each breed yes, individually, exactly right? exactly right. And it's, a, it's what's called a bench show, benching show. Okay. So uh, what that means in part is that the breed or the sh people who are showing um, have to be available for the public to come and talk oh, to them about nice. their breed and nice. so Westminster is such a big fancy show but the fact that it's a benching show yeah. means that anyone can go in the back where the dogs are uh -huh. and you know breeders talk to the uh, the people who are the handlers who are showing them uh -huh. and get a lot of information so I got the card of a woman a breeder Joan Caffelli uh, at the show. She wasn't actually at her bench, but she uh, got her card and I called her as soon as I came uh -huh. back. And she said that she had a male who was she was going to sell as a pet. Uh -huh. uh, and she had someone who wanted it, who'd gotten a dog from her previously, but um, it had gotten run over by oh her neighbor. So oh by God. the person's neighbor. And uh, so she said, my husband doesn't want me to give him another one. And I said, well, tell your husband you have another option. I mean, I had to sort of conjole her into yeah. considering me. And uh, she said, well, I'm going to a show. Call me on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So that next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, I was dialing her number. And she said, you can have the dog, but asked for references. Sure. Required a fenced in yard, which I don't have right. exactly but right. I took pictures of how far the road is from um, from you know the house right and, and she was in West Virginia and we actually drove down there to pick nice. him up she won't put a dog on on a plane yeah. um, so that's a responsible breeder she's very yeah. very they are all of them I yeah. think are and um, so there's a so who did you get then when you went down uh, Ramsey here. You want to pick him up so here. we can kind of see him? Yeah, come here. He's wearing his 
red because we're in the height of hunting season, so we Smart. want it to be visible. How old is he? He is 12. Was he happy to come home with you? Oh, absolutely. And he was so good right from the beginning. Yeah. You know, that's a long drive from West Virginia. Yeah. And we stopped in New Jersey oh, and stayed overnight. And uh, he was, he's just been great ever since. And he's, uh, he's a real uh Who did you get next? Dog. And then um, I decided I wanted another one. <laughs> but they are rather... Uh, Precious in terms of cost, uh -huh. they, they're pricey, and um, so I just sort of was told a few people that I would love to breed them. Uh -huh. And one day, sort of out of the blue, a woman called me and said, "I hear you're interested in breeding Norwich Terriers." And I said, "Well, yeah, well, it seems like a little bit of a pipe dream." And uh, she said, "Well, I have a female that I want to place." And I said, well, how much do you want for her? And she said, well, I want to place her because she's fighting with my other female. So uh -huh. that's when I got Gigi, who's walking off into the distance. <laughs> Gigi! <laughs> Come yeah, back! Gigi! <laughs> anyway, um, and she was not neutered, and neither was he. So I bred them, and that's how I got this little one, Tess. She was one of four in the litter. Um, Aww, and uh, so, so the woman that I got Gigi from just wanted some puppies back in return, which turned out to be a harder thing to accomplish Aww. than I thought. So in that litter of four, um, two survived and two died. And the difference between the ones that survived and the ones that didn't mm -hmm. was a half an ounce in weight. Wow. Yeah, they were, you know, two and a half ounces. And, two ounce and her sibling went back to, to that the, person. Yes, okay. To that person. And then she had one other um, puppy after that, a singleton. And then after that, I just thought, this is craziness because it's <laughs> so, it's so difficult. Yeah, and it's yeah. not, you know, my full time job. It's right. not why I have them. Right. You know, I have them to enjoy them. So then I had everyone new. Well, her she's to lucky because she's got her daddy and mommy exactly. with her. Exactly. And they really do act like a family. It's <laughs> yeah. Cute. He's sort of the playmate, and the mother is the disciplinarian. Okay. <laughs> Listen, there thanks so much for having me over. Thanks, Robin. This is great. I've enjoyed it. Good, good. Okay, we'll see you next time on Breed Spotlight. Wasn't that great to meet Tracy and those Norwich Terriers? They are so cute, and her precious rescue, Remy. Um, that was a lot of fun going out there, and thank you, Tracy. Uh, next, we're going to be doing some dog training with Danielle. Um, Danielle's an experienced dog trainer, and she's going to be talking about positive reinforcement and what that means in training dogs. Uh, we're also having my neighbor come over uh, with her dog, Patience. Uh, he is a young pit bull, and he is just love. Uh, she is just love. That's all she knows. So uh, let's take a look at some of her tricks too. Hi, and welcome to an episode of Bark where we're gonna talk about training. And I have Danielle Langlois with me. And Danielle, thank you so much for coming over. Thank you for letting me be here. I know it's a little chilly out, uh, but uh, fortunately it's not too windy. No, it's pretty good. It's nice and sunny, bright. Okay. So uh, the reason I asked you to come over is uh, to talk about training mm -hmm. and uh, people may have a dog that they feel that uh, they want to train or maybe they've tried training and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, I know there's different types of training. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well the way that I train is I train with positive reinforcement. Now. A lot of people will say that they use positive reinforcement, but use many different methods. I don't use any aversive training methods such as pinch collars or choke collars because positive reinforcement, by definition, is you reward the good and they get nothing for the bad. So if I was asking a dog to sit and they did, they would get the reward for the sit. If not, they get no attention from me, they get no treat, no nothing. And so they're working for the lifestyle they want, which is to be paid attention to by us or to get the little yum yum or to get a toy or whatever. That uh, choke collar you talked about, um, 
that's like on a loop, right? And they yeah, pull and it. Yeah, and it has the prongs. Oh, and the prongs? That mm -hmm. looks painful. It can be, and that's what it's meant to use for, is it's meant to agitate the dog into doing what they're asking them to do. I heard once that, um, well, this is actually from uh, Caesar on that dog show, mm -hmm. uh, where he said that if you cause pain to a dog, it makes them fearful, and fear creates aggression. It can, absolutely, and a lot of people use the pinch collars in absolutely the wrong way. I see a lot of people with aggressive dogs, they put the pinch collar on their dog thinking it's going to stop the behavior, but mentally that dog is actually thinking this hurts more, so whatever I'm looking at, whatever I'm aggressive towards is actually going to create a worse behavior, especially if you decide to go out without that pinch collar. Oh, right, because then they're not going to feel that. Exactly, yeah. and then they're just going to have an extreme explosion. So let's talk a little bit about um, positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, other than, hey, you're a good dog, here's your treat, uh, do you have other devices? I know you were going to talk a little bit about a clicker. Yep, I use clickers in all of my training. Clickers are a wonderful tool because it's a consistent sound that tells the dog exactly they're doing exactly what we're asking for. So going back to the sit example, if you're teaching a dog who has never been taught sit before, the clicker will help them learn exactly what it means. So you would start by luring them by taking a treat, putting it over their head, and then the very second their butt hits the ground, they hear uh, this noise. Uh. And it tells them, yes, that's what I want. And you can use it in any behavior. And the reason why it's better for the clicker versus a voice is when you're telling them, yes, good boy, okay, that can change if you lose your voice, if you have a bad day. Right. That yes could be yes, yes, yes. And all yeah. of those can confuse the dog. Yeah. This is a totally consistent noise. Now, so as soon as you click, you treat. Yeah, especially at the beginning. As they get more advanced, they can hear the click, but not necessarily receive the treat right away. Okay. But absolutely. Okay, that's neat. Um, now, um, I did a little bit of clicker training with Minnie, and it seemed to work. Uh, for me to just say okay, but I know there's a problem with okay because I remember actually uh, a trainer down in Nashua that mm -hmm. I went to a long time ago um, told me, let's say you have asked your dog to, to stay or to wait mm -hmm. and you're across the street mm -hmm. and you're talking to somebody and you say to them, oh, okay, you know, and they hear okay and they start running across the street to you where you're absolutely right. I hate the word okay, especially as a release word. Normally for something like that, I would use something that I can always remember, be consistent with, and that's unique. So something I don't say all the time. Pizza. Pizza. I've, I've had dogs who use beef jerky before, but normally you hear free, all done. Um, go play, things like that. Just as long as you're always consistent and like, okay, you don't say it frequently. All right, all right. Um, I also wanted to ask you about um, managing a situation where you have a dog that has bad behavior. Absolutely. I know um, I have friends that with loving dogs and uh, they just love to jump all over me. <laughs> yeah. And so it doesn't necessarily, when I say bad behavior, it doesn't necessarily mean that the dog's biting me. Yeah. You know, it's just maybe something that's kind of a hassle. An unwanted behavior. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, things like that, especially when you're dealing with positive reinforcement, you want to deal with a little bit differently. Especially when you're thinking about jumping, a lot of people think, put your knee up, push them down. Right. But if you really think about it, all of those things are giving the dog exactly what they want, which is attention. That, oh, she touched me, mm -hmm. I'll just mm -hmm. keep jumping. <laughs> and so we really have to totally ignore it or um, put them somewhere where they can't get to us. Mm -hmm. Such as if they jump on me, I were to say off and totally turn, turn around, around to ignore them. Okay. If that didn't work, I may follow up with something such as a timeout, which would be to put them in a small room, not their crate, for only about 20 to 30 seconds, and then bring them out and tell or show them that if they don't do this, life continues as normal, nothing special. But if they continue to, they get 
segregated again. Yeah, like a timeout for a kid or exactly, something. Exactly, except you're not forgetting them for an hour. <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, okay, I appreciate that information. Absolutely. And what I wanted to do is bring my neighbor's dog over. Sure, absolutely. And uh, we could try maybe a little bit uh, impromptu training. She also has a very cute trick that she does that I want to show you. So uh, let's get her to come over. Awesome, okay. thanks. Thank you. <sighs> okay, well, I think my friend Emily's coming over with her dog Patience now. So, Emily. Hi. Hi, Patience. What patience, 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 sit. Good girl. Good sit. Good sit. Well, um, I appreciate you coming over with patience. And um, I was just talking with Danielle about training. And so maybe she could help you out with patience a little bit. <laughs> because patience never does things like that. No. <laughs> Like I was saying before, clicker is used to mark the behavior. Mm -hmm. And so if I have patience, if I were to ask patience to do something, such as sit, I would click the very second her butt hits the ground and then deliver the treat. Okay. Now, initially to get the dogs knowing, oh, this means really good things, we have to load the clicker. So in order to do that, I'm not gonna ask her anything. All I'm gonna do is click, and no matter where she is, give her that treat. Even if she's 10 feet away, if I click, I better run that 10 feet to give her that treat. And by loading it properly, she'll start to look and see where it is. And that's when you know, okay, she's starting to pay attention to the clicker, know, and make that association of this sound means good things. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can start to use it to teach her things like not jumping, sitting down, whatever she needs to know but it is a learning tool. So you don't have to use it all the time as far as once she knows something, you can just stop using it. It's not something you're gonna use for her whole life. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. That's something that can help her to learn things such as roll over. Absolutely, and, yeah, okay. absolutely. Great. Patience, my tree, sit. Patience knows a very good trick. I'm gonna stay. Stay, stay, now I can even walk away and she will stay in that position until I give her the command. Okay. Is that a neat trick that patients can do? I love it. And thank you so much, Emily, for bringing her over. And thank you so much, Danielle, for joining us. I hope you're going to be on the show again. Then next, we're going to take a look at A Minute from Minnie. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Minnie. I am so happy to have the spotlight here and a minute to talk to my fellow dog friends and say hello, hello, hello. Now, do you have a question for me? Would you like me to help you with any problem? Is anything making you sad? Are you sad? Well, I will help. Please, dog friends, write me a bark and I will give you my best advice. I do have my first letter here from Skippy. Dear Minnie, could you please tell me how to get my owner to take me out on walks more often? Okay, Skippy, this is difficult to do, especially in the age of the iPad, iPhone, ay ay ay. Okay, do this. Jump up and down, bark a lot, and bring them your leash with the saddest eyes you can manage. Will you try this please? And let me know. Okay, have fun my dog friends, and bark! Thanks Minnie, I think you've been very helpful and you, your advice will be well received by that sad puppy. Hi, and thank you for watching Bark. This segment is going to be on Healthy Pets, and we're actually at Healthy Pets New Hampshire. And we're going to be talking about dog massage with April Bagosh yeah. and her dog Tucker. Tucker, yes. And uh, what can you tell me about dog massage? Well, actually, dog massage has not been around for a long, long time within this country, although it did, the massage on animals actually started with equine massage. And that actually has been around, I want to say, since like the 19. 50s, if I've got that correct. The history might be a little off, mm -hmm. but um, dog massage itself, and really pet massage. I know we're talking about dogs today, but you can do it on cats, you can do it on dogs, and of course oh, it started okay. with, yeah, yeah, you can do it on all animals. 
um, started with the horse massage or the equine massage. And, it, you know, now what it's being used for, there's a lot of uses. It can be sort of rehabilitative. It can be um, preventative in, in, in its applications. Um, but, a, you know, people are doing massage. People are more and more interested in the holistic right. approach to their own health. Right. And they're translating that to their pets. They're translating that in the way that they feed them and the way that they work with them from exercise standpoint and whatnot. Energy therapies are being used on dogs. And so it made sense that if people were starting to use massage more frequently for themselves, that we could use it on our pets. So today, we're going to focus more on the wellness aspect of the massage for pets. Okay. There are rehabilitative aspects, but when you are doing rehabilitative aspects, it's absolutely important that you're in conjunction with a vet and that you have a trained um, professional to be able to actually administer the massage. Whereas pet massage itself can be done by a pet owner on their pet if you have just a few basic techniques and yeah. rules that you want to follow. And so that's what we'll focus on today because I think okay. most people want to kind of know how they do it with yeah, their own animals. definitely. And as far as, you know, when and what you should be careful of and those kinds of things. So the basic premise of it was just, it really came around that if we were going to get it, it must be good for our pets, so why not? Well, I think we, I do a little bit of that with yeah. my dog. Right. Um, but I don't really know if I'm doing anything specific. Well, and here's what I say even about humans. So, I, you know, yes, I'm Healthy Pets New Hampshire, but I actually have been a human massage therapist for 20 years. Okay. And so... There's no right or wrong. I mean, there's safe and unsafe, and there are, you have to be educated as a human in the state, you have to be licensed, but there is no certification or licensing for working with animals, and that's why we can work with humans as far as their pet owners and pet professionals mm -hmm. to teach them how to work with their own pets. Um, there's no right or wrong. I mean, if you are petting your animal, yeah. you're giving them a massage. Yeah. This is the, the great thing and the beauty of working with animals in massage. Animals are really energetic creatures. Now, so are humans, but humans, we're very intellectual. We've stepped aside from our more energetic and spiritual personalities, mm -hmm. and we've kind of gone into our intellectual personalities. Mm -hmm. And so when we're receiving a massage as humans, you know, we're feeling the muscles, we're asking questions about the muscles, we know about an acre of pain. We're very disconnected from our own bodies in a lot of yes. ways. Yes. Animals are not. And so the beauty of animal massage is that they will guide the session and because they are very, very energetic, there, it's not necessary that you go through an entire whole body session. It, like, for instance, Tucker has something that's called a luxating patella. It's a that's trick. The knee. Knee, it's the knee, exactly. And small yeah. breeds are prone to it, especially yeah. terrier breeds. And so, because he has that, if we go out on long hikes, because of course Jack Russells need to burn energy, if we go out on long hikes or he's done a lot of running or jumping or whatever, it can be triggered. Mm -hmm. And it actually can cause a lot of, um, he has a lot of tension in his lower back and his mm -hmm. hip area. So you don't have to do a full body routine on an animal. You can do very site specific work with them. And what you're doing as the therapist is being an energetic conduit to the animal. So he knows what he needs. Yeah. And if I simply bring attention to a part of his body for him mm -hmm. by having the touch, having my energy, you know, all of my heat right. and whatnot working with him, right. then he will actually go through the healing process himself. So he'll focus on where you're massaging. He'll focus, exactly. That's yeah. the thing. And with humans, it's the same thing. You should be bringing their awareness to a body part, yeah. but we're so in our heads oh, yeah. all the time. I'm sure while you're getting, while a person's getting massaged, they're thinking, what do I got to go do after, right after this? They're, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're thinking about that, or they're thinking about like what they did to do this, or what, and right. they're thinking about everything but Christmas shopping this time of year. Right. So dogs, are, dogs and cats are not like that. They are so in the moment, and they are so in tune with their own oh. body and their own energy. Yeah. That as long as you create the space for them to be able to receive well, they will receive. And you don't have to worry. I mean, you're simply being with your animal because you have your own dog. You're simply being with her yeah. and touching her in intention, yeah. being present, being there with the thought and the feeling and right. the energy that you're sending healing right. to her. It will happen. Yeah. So that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It's, there's no real trick to it. Now, I mean, do you have to sort of know your way around a body? Yeah. Do you have to know how much pressure to apply? Yes, yeah. you don't want to hurt yeah, them. It's yeah. totally different than working yeah. with people. Um, and every animal is different, just like every person is different. Well, I know that there's a benefit to um, not just petting your dog, and uh, maybe this is part of the massage, but making sure to touch them, like on their pads yes. and yep. on their nails, so they just, their ears and tails. All just over. Get, used to right. being touched there so they don't freak out when they get to the vet and somebody touches and them. And that's there. a really good point. I mean, not all of us have the benefit of having an animal from puppy or kitten because a lot of us are adopting, we're rescuing mm -hmm. and they're older mm -hmm. at that point. 
But even more important when you have a rescued pet, because you don't know their background, you don't know their, their history, mm -hmm. and so they come with stuff. And so it's our job to help them work through their stuff and give them a protected space. And so you bring up a very good point. As part of Healthy Pets New Hampshire, one of the things, when I teach my wellness massage routine to, to pet owners, what we do, you like this? What we do is um, we teach them in a very systematic approach, like a routine. So, mm -hmm. it, so it's actually called a snout to tail wellness assessment okay. or wellness massage. Okay. And so it just reminds you that there are all these parts of your dog's body. But if you're going to be doing what we would call a massage, I take it a step further and I call it touch with intention. So you're petting with intention. And so what it is is I am petting him, but the, all the while that I'm petting him, I'm actually taking note of things that I'm feeling on him, mm -hmm. especially in the summer, ticks, ticks these, yeah. things like that. So I'm That's taking note of it. all the things that I'm feeling on him. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to kind of like do a little quick peek and look and see in their ears right. and their mouths and things right. like that. It's still part of the massage. It's all part of touch. It's bringing awareness to them about parts of their body. But it's also allowing you as a pet owner to, exactly like you said, be very aware of what's going on in their body and it's creating a bond between you and your pet but it's also teaching them that touch is okay and it's safe. I know with Tucker he doesn't love to have his front legs touched. He doesn't really love his legs period but like if I go to touch his legs he will quickly mm -hmm. move away mm -hmm. from it. He, I, we almost never get full ma massage into the, the legs for him but it does get them used to it. So if they go to a groomer, if they go to a vet, if they go to a trainer, any mm -hmm. place where they're going to go either with or without you, mm -hmm. if you do this three to five times a week they're going to be so used to being handled that it's going to be like second nature to them. And the most important part of that, and this gets a little off subject of massage, but the really important part for that is that like, let's say that there's some kind of an emergency that you have with your pet and you need to apply for a aid care or you need to do, give them some kind of care. Mm -hmm. If they're so used to you handling them that when that comes up, they don't freak out about it and they actually they let you do what you, you need to do, then you really, it's, you buy a lot of advantages yeah. for yourself and for your animal by simply having touched them. You know, um, April, something else that you brought up before when I talked to you about this, um, kind of, uh, I remember it because it struck a chord for me, and that was, um, it also can bring out um, an issue yeah. that you could become aware of if suddenly when you're touching your dog in this area, you've touched him on his stomach before during massage, yeah. and suddenly he's he's wincing or yelping when you touch right. that area. Right, and that's when we, when the, the wellness part of the assessment, as we call it, the massage or the wellness assessment, is exactly that. So if you do this consistently three to five times a week, you know what baseline is for your pet. If we're going to talk about doing the wellness massage from the standpoint of a snout to tail, so we don't leave any part of the body out, the first thing that you want to do is work with the snout, which is the muzzle. And so in Tucker's case, you can see as you're looking at him that he has this nice black nose. So that is the part of the nose that we want to make sure that we're just going to do a quick touch. From touching that, I can feel that it's moist. I can feel that it's cold. And so while I'm there, I'm going to give him a little bit of a touch over the top of his muzzle. I'm working along his cheeks, just about where his upper gums would be. And I'm just doing light work there. You don't have to do anything really deep or anything heavy at all within the face. And now ears, very close attention to the ears. Just like with people, there are a lot of reflex points that end in the ears that refer back to other parts of the body. These circular motions, what I'm doing is I'm starting at the front of the shoulders and I'm actually just working my way down the shoulders to, to hit, at this point to him being on the table. So I start at the top and I go down the shoulder blades and down the shoulders and in little circular motions in rows. So one row overlaps the next until I've gotten the entire shoulder covered. Coming down and through here and I'm actually going to continue down the length of the spine finishing up the, the rib cage and getting down more towards sort of the thoracic area now. But I'm going to do this connecting stroke. Always trying to keep your hands on them, giving a nice connecting stroke. There's a lot of warmth under my hands right now, and he's feeling that. This is our warmth, our, our energy is connecting. Well, I really appreciate you letting me come out today, and I definitely learned a lot. Good. Um, and I love Tucker. He's oh, a wonderful dog. He's doing good. The first time in front of the camera, he did good. <laughs> well, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, absolutely. And you can take this and do this with your own animals because it's they love it. It's good for you. It's good for them, and it's great for everybody's health. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, a few quick reminders. Uh, I want to remind everyone that there is a leash law, so make sure you keep your dogs safe and keep them on a leash. 
Thank you so much to everyone for helping me with this first episode of Bark. Now, maybe you have a unique breed or maybe you have a story about your dog that you'd like to share. Well, I'd like to come out and film that. So please contact me and I will put on my email address on the screen and uh, send me an email and let me know. And thank you everyone. Bye-bye.